Piranglo Prabhu ji, do you want to start it? 2.63? Okay, thank you. Yes, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Um, Kroda Bhavati Samoha Samohat Smriti Vri Brahma Smriti Bram Shad Budi Nasho Budi Nashat Pranya Pranashyati Translation From anger, complete delusion arises and from delusion, bewilderment of memory. When memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost. And when intelligence is lost, one falls down again in the material pool. Pure part. Srila Rupa Goswami has given us this direction. Prapam chikataya buddha hari sambadi vastuna mumus kshubi pari tiago varagyam falu gatyate bhakti rasamrita sindhu by development of Krishna consciousness one can know that everything has it use in the service of the Lord. Those who are without knowledge of Krishna consciousness artificially try to avoid material objects. And as a result, and through their desire liberation from material bondage, they do not attend to the perfect stage of renunciation. Their so-called renunciation is called falgu or less important. On the other end, a person in Krishna consciousness knows how to use everything in the service of the Lord. Therefore, he does not become a victim of material consciousness. For example, for an impersonalist, the Lord or the Absolute, being impersonal, cannot eat. Whereas an impersonalist tries to avoid good eatables, a devotee knows that Krishna is a supreme enjoyer and that he eats all that is offered to him in devotion. So after offering good eatables to the Lord, the devotee takes the remnants called prasadam. Thus everything becomes spiritualized and there is no danger of a downfall. The devotee takes prasadam in Krishna consciousness whenever he, the devote, non-devotees rejects it as material. The impersonalist, therefore, cannot enjoy life due to his artificial renunciation. And for this reason, a slight agitation of the mind pulls him down again into the pool of material existence. It is said that such a soul, even through rising up, at the up to the point of liberation, falls down again due to his not having support in devotional service. So these are the different stages of bow down, which uh, happen when when we don't control the mind. You see, we had in the previous verse a continue continuation from the previous verse. We heard. We begin by contemplating the senses. We think about material enjoyment. We think about something in the mind. We become attached to it. And then we want the desire to have it. We have some lust to get it. And when we don't get it, we become angry. Right? So then this verse begins from anger. After the anger, then what happens? What's the result of the anger? Complete delusion arises. And the, from delusion, bewilderment of memory. And then when the memory is bewildered, then intelligence is lost. And when we have no, no more intelligence, then we fall into the material pool. So Srila Prabhupada is explaining in the purport the difference between the, the Mayavadi philosophy and the Vaishnava philosophy, because we're both concerned to control the senses. So the Mayavadi, the impersonalist people, their process is dry renunciation. 
as Prabhupada describes, they eat, they'll eat very austerely, very simple, very plain. They won't eat any nice tasty food because they think that's maya, they think that's sense gratification. But in Krishna consciousness, we like to have nice prasadam. We take food which is offered to Krishna. And by doing that, we control the senses. So their renunciation, the, the Mayavadi people, they renounce, but their renunciation makes the heart very dry and hard. They don't get any real pleasure from it. But in Krishna consciousness, our renunciation is in relation to Krishna, that we take Krishna prasadam. And by taking Krishna prasadam, we become purified. So our renunciation is called yukta vairagya, right? Pra Prabhupada, you see it's written there in the purport, paugu vairagya, vairagyam paugu katayate. That's the mayavadi renunciation, paugu vairagya, vairagya paugu, paugu false. There's a river Paugu. It looks like sand, but actually there's water below it. So the same way there are people, they look renounced, but in their mind they have so many material desires. So Krishna conscious process is to purify the desires, not to stop desire, but to purify them. So that's quite a different process. You purify the desire. And you pu the purification comes about by connecting to Krishna. When we're connected to Krishna, then we become purified. Because Krishna purifies everything, everyone. Just like the sunshine purifies everything. So Krishna is more powerful than even the sun. He can purify, he can purify our hearts take away all the material desires. But we have to do service. We have to we engage in devotional activity, chanting and hearing about him and offering service to him and worshiping him. In this way, we, be, we become purified. But the Mayavadi, they want to stop everything. Oh, they don't see anything, they don't want to see the world, they want to go away from the world, go and hide in a cave. You can go and hide in a cave, but after you come out of the cave, all your material desires will be there even more than before. So going in a cave doesn't stop material desires, or taking a vow of silence doesn't stop material desires. But if we engage in Krishna conscious activities, that will purify our desires. Instead of trying to stop activities, we want to do activities, but do activities for the pleasure of Krishna. That is bhakti yoga. And you'll see in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is going to learn that he should fight for the pleasure of Krishna. So everything is done for the pleasure of Krishna. Is that clear to everyone? Any questions? Uh, yes, Guru Maharaj. I'm uh, right. It's possible. Uh, uh... Yes, Prabhuji, you're right. I will say okay. to Guru Maharaj. Is, the, is there the possibility of eating together with the offering of food to Krishna and not afterwards? So I'm don't sorry. pour... The, so, Prabhu, uh, Guru Maharaj, I'm just trying to read this question in the chat. Yeah. In the chat, yeah, I'll, I'll open the chat. Maybe I can read it also. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Is there the possibility of eating together of eating together with the offering of food to Krishna and not afterwards. So don't pour the don't pour the, the food offered to Krishna 
on my plate, but do this towards the end, so I feel that Krishna eats with me. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not <laughs> a bit difficult for me, John. Is there the possibility of eating together with an offering to food? Not afterwards. <laughs> For the food offered to Krishna on my plate. But uh, do, well, the food offered to Krishna is, you know, that's what we should have on our plate. Everything should be offered to Krishna. You shouldn't, you know, you, when we take prasadam, well, it's all offered to Krishna. The food offered to Krishna is, is the only thing we should have on our plate. We don't want to have anything on our plate which is not offered to Krishna. Oh. Do that, do this towards the end. You mean after you've eaten the food not offered to Krishna, I then give you the food offered to Krishna. <laughs> so I feel that Krishna eats with me. Well, it's not that Krishna eats with us, but we want to eat Krishna's remnants. You see, prasadam is the remnants of Krishna. We eat after Krishna. First, we let Krishna eat. Krishna is the master, we are his servants. So when we offer the food to Krishna, Krishna eats it. And then, after Krishna has honored the food, then we take afterwards. So that's when we are taking prasadam. Not that we're eating with Krishna, but we eat after Krishna, after Krishna has taken his prasadam. Krishna takes his meal first. And then we take Krishna's remnants. Prasada means mercy of Krishna. So prasadam is the remnants of Lord Krishna. And we take that prasadam after Lord Krishna has accepted the offering. Okay. Hey, Krishna Maharaj, yes. Hey, it's funny because I'm in the same um uh, I, I would I have to I wanted to ask the same question <laughs> as Simon told asked you you know because at home personally it's difficult to have the same standard as in a temple for example when I'm cooking sometimes I taste the food to see if it's cooked so it's completely forbidden in a temple right you cannot do this to offer to Krishna uh, well, I've seen some cooks do it Oh, okay, okay. Some cooks do do it because they, they're cooking a big quantity and mm -hmm. they want it to be right. So they, okay. make, they, make, they may not do it all the time, but mm -hmm. sometimes they may do it. Okay, okay, okay. Mm. And, uh, and sometimes I forget to offer to Krishna. <laughs> and while we go, we start to eat and I say, oh, what about Damodar? We forget him. Ah, <gasps> what uh, consciousness we have. So... Very quick, we make his, he has three plates, three nice plates, three nice plates, and we offer him at that moment. At the same time, we start to eat, and we eat in the kitchen together. It's not he has not an altar in another room. His altar is just in a corner of the kitchen. So I think, my God, I don't follow at all the uh, the, the the standard of the Vaishnava worship that I learned in the temple, is temple, you know, so I feel guilty sometimes, but I, but I think, uh, well, yeah. It, the, the important thing is the mood of devotion. You know, the, the rules and regulations, they come later, you know, but the Krishna appreciates the mood, the actual service mood, the attitude. Mm, yes. your, your facilities are limited, of course, you don't have a proper 
temple room and you, you eat in the kitchen where you're cooking. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, that's, you know, Krishna will accept that. But still, the fact that you try to offer, that's appreciated by Krishna. Yes, but Guru Maharaj. You, you do want to try to remember to offer, you know, and even if you do the offering quickly, you know, for free, but uh, you do want to try to remember to offer to Krishna. That's important. And I hope one day, maybe in Vaikuntha, I will be able to eat with Krishna. Well, if you become qualified to become a cow yeah. boy, yeah. yes. <laughs> That takes many lifetimes. Takes a long time, yes, yes, yes. But this offering, it's, it's to offer to Krishna and to take uh, the remnants and to think about it's, you know, it's, the, yeah, it makes my heart uh, feel peaceful and con con connected with Damodar. So it's just, uh, yeah, devotional service. Hmm? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, even yeah. if it's not first class, even if it's not so uh, in the standard, but like you said, it's about love. Yeah, it's a, it's a mood. It's not the rules and regulations, but the mood yes. is there, the mood. You know? So you, you have the right mood. Yes. Thinking of Krishna. So Krishna doesn't mind that you're eating in the kitchen. And yes. You don't have a you don't have a prasadam room, <laughs> you know, at home, yes. you don't have a prasadam room, but, you but you're doing your best according to the time, place, and circumstances. Circumstances. Right? Mm. Time, the place, and the circumstances. So that's the important. Mm. Thank you. I hope that Simon is uh, satisfied with your answer. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, Vaishnavi. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Next verse, 62.64. Tanmay Prabhu, can you please read it? Yes, Patani, sure. Raga Desha Bimuktaishtu Visayan Indriyais Charan Atmavasyair Videt Vidyatma prasad, prasadam adhigachati. But, uh, but the person free from all attachment and aversion and able to control his senses through regulated principles of freedom can obtain the complete mercy of the Lord. It is already explained that the one that one may externally control the senses by some artificial process, but unless the senses are engaged in transcendental service of Lord, there is every chance of a fall. Although the person is full in, although the person in full Krishna consciousness may apparently be on the sensual plane, because of his being Krishna conscious, he has no attachment to sensual activities. The Krishna conscious person is concerned only with the satisfaction of Krishna and nothing else. Therefore, he is transcendental to all attachment and detachment. If Krishna wants the devotee, if Krishna wants, the devotee can do anything which is ordinarily undesirable. And if Krishna does not want, he shall not do that which he would have ordinarily done for his own satisfaction. Therefore, to act or not to act is within his control because he acts only under the direction of Krishna. This consciousness is the causeless mercy of the Lord, which the devotee can achieve in spite of his being attached to the sensual platform. So after describing the fall down, now Krishna is describing what's required to avoid that fall down. So, so he says we have to be free from this attachment and aversion. 
raga and dvaisha, attachment, things we want to get, and aversion, things we don't want. No, we are, we, some, some things we want, some things we don't want. We want to get away from them. So this kind of mood, this attachment and aversion, this is not very good. This is not devotional service. A devotee just accepts everything. This is the plan of Krishna, the arrangement of Krishna. It's not that he's attached or it's not that he dislikes something. He just accepts everything. This way, he has to also control his senses. And the method of controlling the senses through regulative principles of freedom. So what are these regulated principles of freedom? That is not just simply what we would think the four principles. Oh, I'm a vegetarian, no meat, fish and egg, no intoxication, no gambling, no illicit sex. That's not the four that's not the regulated principles of freedom. Rather, regulated principles of freedom are the principles of bhakti yoga. Eating food offered to Krishna, reading the scriptures like Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, chanting the holy name, waking up quite early in the morning. You know, lead, leading a devotional life. That, that is what the regulated principles of freedom are. And when we follow like that, then we can get this prasadam adigachati. We can get the mercy of Lord Krishna. So we want to get the mercy of Lord Krishna. We have to try to develop this, control the senses through devotional service by doing regularly hearing and chanting, using our senses like that. You know, we don't get into watching too many Bollywood movies or cricket matches. We're not too much worried about the stock market. We're not so much caring about the weather forecast. Okay, whatever is going to be, will be. We just want, we're going to chant, we're going to read the scripture, we're going to cook for Krishna, offer everything to Krishna. In this way, we'll get the mercy of Krishna. So people think, oh, this is not freedom. They don't know what is freedom. People think, you know, people think, I'm free. I can smoke and I can drink alcohol and I can go, go everywhere and do all kinds of things. They think, I'm free to enjoy. But they don't know that they're not free and they're not enjoying. They're suffering under the material energy. They're suffering under the material nature. They're servants of their mind and senses. So they're not actually happy. But if we surrender to Krishna, if we take up devotional service, then we won't suffer like that. Then we will be saved. Isn't it a fact? What do you say, Simon? Uh, don't comment. Uh, it's it's okay. I understand. Yeah. What do you think, Tanmay? I completely understand and I agree, Prabhu. Also. Okay. Very good. Yeah, it's difficult to get people to. Uh, Take up Krishna consciousness. Uh, Guru Maharaj, there is some question in the chat, Guru Maharaj. Really? Who from? 
from Uday and Tanmay. Okay. Uh, regarding soul, it is said that soul is eternal, but daily world population is increasing. How is it? We are facing mass extinction of species. From where new souls are coming, it means all animals are being born as humans. How population equation of population increase? <laughs> uh, Prabhu, actually, it was not my question. I was saying that uh, as population increases, we are also there are a lot of animals and species are going away as well. Yes, animals. Some animals and species are going away, but not all. Only a few. Mm. Okay. So it is said the soul is eternal, but daily world population is increasing. How? Well, as you mentioned, it could be that the souls are coming up from the animal species. Not only animal species, of course, there's souls in all living entities. The trees also have souls. The grass also has souls. And then COVID-19 is also a soul, <laughs> right? These viruses which are going around, they also, their souls. We're facing a mass extinction of species also. Some species, yes, some of this, like, because man is doing so many sinful things. People are doing terrible things, like they're, they're going hunting the whales, and so the whales are in danger. And then the bees also, people have done a lot of bad things to the bees, so there's less, not many bees anymore. I'm taking all the fish out of the sea because people are eating all the fish. So these things are going on. From, from where new souls are coming. Well, remember, there's so many other planets. We're only one planet. And so there are souls everywhere. The, and there's, there's, we're only one planet in one tiny universe. But there are many, many universes. Our universe is a small one because Brahma only has four heads. But in the bigger universes, Brahma has many more heads. And so these bigger universes also have many, many souls. So these souls, some souls come here. Some of our souls may go there. There's a, a lot of transit going on. You know, we're traveling. We're moving around from one universe to another. Brahmanda Brahmite Kunya Bhagavan Jeev. Brahmanda is a universe, right? So we've been moving since time immemorial, since a very long time we've been in this material world. And we're moving through all these different species. Sometimes we're in the higher planet. Sometimes we're a demigod. Sometimes we're a bird or we're a worm or some insect or a flower. So, so many things. So the number of souls is infinite and the number of souls is also fixed. It's not that the souls are being created, but the souls are moving. They come from other universes. Some souls, you know, and some souls are even in the Brahma Jyoti. So some souls from the Brahma Jyoti some, sometimes will come back here because, because they still have some material desire, desires. So there's, there's no new souls. It's not that souls are taking birth, but they're coming from other places. Some are coming from other universes in the material world, and some are coming from higher, from the spiritual world. Because some souls, like the demons who were killed by Krishna, you know, Kamsa was a demon. And remember who Kamsa was in his previous life? Do you remember anybody? 
was Kamsa in his previous life? He was a little. Huh? He was a garden. Um, Vaikuntha? Well, no, he was a demon named Kala Nemi. In his previous life, he was a demon named Kala Nemi, and that time he was killed by Lord Vishnu. So then he took birth as Kamsa. And Kamsa, of course, was killed by Lord Krishna. And then Kamsa was fortunate that he was able to go back to the spiritual world because he was killed by Krishna. But generally the demons who are killed by Krishna, they go to the Brahmajoiti. They enter into the light. They don't go into the planet. But they will go into the light and they'll be in the light of the universe for some time. So there's a lot of souls everywhere moving around. Every atom, you know, you've got Paramatmas in every atom. And you've got the Jivatmas in every form of life. Every living entity, every tree, every germ, insect, everything, they all have souls. Have you ever checked out the population on the ants or the <laughs> mosquitoes? All these different, they also have souls, you know. So that's why you can't really, we can't really understand what's happening. But one thing we know also, that a lot of humans are not going back to Godhead. From the human form of life, they could go back to Godhead. So what happens when they don't go back to Godhead? They may take a human birth again. Just like if you go to school, and if you don't do well at school, maybe they'll keep you back and you have to do the whole year again. You take a course and you fail the course, and then you have to take the whole course again. So that's what happening, that's, that's happening here on this planet. Many humans have got the human body and they're not making it back to Godhead. So they have to come back again and they get a human body again. So that way, you know, there's souls coming up from the animal species, they're coming up and they're getting the human body and some humans, they're, they're staying, they're taking birth again and again and again. They stay as humans. And some humans go down, go to hell. But the pious ones who are a bit better, they will stay, they will take birth again. Is it any clearer? Yes, Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. oh. Maharaj, we, we, can, we may say that the spiritual life starts when there is a, you, you accept that there is a soul, right? There is a difference between the body and the soul. Yeah. And there starts uh, your, your, your travel to another dimension. The, the, connection with Krishna or um, yeah it's the first step right to accept that there is a soul if you don't accept this I mean it's yeah you go nowhere right um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you have to go on from there that you know that's just knowing we're a soul that's the mayavadis that's the impersonalists the jnanis but devotees they want to understand not just that we're a soul, but there's a God also. And we're not God, but we have a relationship with God. Yes. So that's more important. Yes. Just yes. simply knowing we're the soul, mm -hmm. that, that doesn't give us any real happiness. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make us a devotee. No. Mm -hmm. Sure. We have to understand that there's a God, there's a supreme person behind the world. And we want, we want to be in relationship with him. We want to serve him and recognize him. Cultivate our relationship with him. 
if he wants us, if he will accept us, of course, we have to be very humble to approach him. Because he's, he is so great and we're so small. So it's very important for us to be, to be humble in approaching him. But if we, if we don't know that there's a God, we just simply know that I'm a soul, then we can become a bit proud of that. We can become proud thinking, I'm a soul, I'm not the body. So it's really important to understand that we're, we're, we're all servants. We're not the masters, we're servants. We have a relationship with the master. He's the supreme and we're servants. And anybody who does some service for Krishna, they get the greatest benefit. They don't lose by serving Krishna. You give something to Krishna, you, Krishna will give back much more than what we gave to, for him. Have, have you got an experience like that? You give something to Krishna or you do something for Krishna and he makes it so easy, so wonderful for us after that. I mean, here in Geneva, for many years, there was no Bhakta Sangha, you know? There was no association really. Yeah. After the temple went away in Zurich, so there was just, uh, yeah, some meeting sometime lasted five years and after everybody went away and, and finally now Krishna sent Vaishnavi and she's so powerful and she's so great and so devotional, full of devotion. And she made this uh, uh, congreg congregation here in Geneva and it's, uh, it's just uh, wonderful because I'm here in Geneva alone and all of a sudden comes Vaishnavi with Simon, um, with um, um, yeah, Tan Moy and all these uh, great souls. So for me, it's a greatest gift that uh, I was chanting sometime uh, my beats uh, and Krishna gave me all this association. And Vaishnavi brings your holiness here in my humble house, here in, 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 in the village lost outside of Geneva. So I can see that all these uh, just giving, for, for, Krishna is giving me all this. So sure, it's uh, 10 times, millions of times more than I could expect. I have this okay. association. <laughs> it's uh, just, uh, yeah, thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Vaishnavi. Yeah, Krishna's taking care of all of us. Mm -mm. When, when he sees that we're ready, then he, he reciprocates, you know? Yeah, yeah. He just more. We, we just have to keep the desire and Krishna will give more and more. You know, at this time, at this time with the virus everywhere, so the whole world is affected. So even if we have a big center, it's not much use because there are many big temples which are not open and the, the public are not able to come. And so, you know, now you're on the same level as everybody else. You know, you can make use of your uh, telecommunication, use your mobile phone or whatever, and you can watch lectures, you can hear classes given by wonderful yes. devotees from different parts of the world. You know, it's very nice. Krishna is giving to everyone an equal chance. Krishna said, I'm equal to everyone. And we can see, we can see that equality now. And we're all getting a chance to remember him. And to be engaged in his service. And 
the good service is to hear about Krishna. <laughs> oh, my God. In the material world, everybody wants to become a master, right? Uh, nobody wants to become a servant. And uh, now we are reading that we have to become a servant of Krishna. Um, yes. Yeah. It, uh, yes, Guru Maharaj. Uh, yeah, Krishna, like we have, uh, how to uh, take it, Guru Maharaj? Because in the material world, everybody wants to do their best. They want to do the, they want to be the best student, best devotee. Uh, Everything uh, we want to become uh, the best or something like that. Well, that's not the devotee mood. Oh. Devotee mood just um, devotees want to be the servant. We just want the servant. We just want to be the servant of the servant. You know, we cannot do anything on our own. We're not the best. We're not the worst. We're not the best. We're very small and insignificant. So we just pray that we can be engaged in some service. Please engage me in your service. That's the thinking of the devotee. And the, the results, they are given by Krishna. So sometimes you get a good result, and sometimes you don't get any result. But it's okay. You know, we tried. And the attempt is the, the devotional service. Making the attempt to serve Krishna, that's the important not the result. Krishna is not so much worried about the result, but he likes to see the endeavor. He likes to see the effort, the trouble the devotee will take to try to do service for him. So that's more important. Yes, Uh, Ramya Mataji, do you want to read the next one? No. Yes. Prasad Sarva Dukhahanam Hanir Asyo Pajayate Prasanna Set uh, setasu Yesu Buddhi Prayabhashite translation. For one, the satisfied in Krishna consciousness, threefold miseries of material existence exists no longer. In such satisfaction, consciousness, one's intelligence is soon well established. Mm. So, again, continuing from the previous verse, for one thus satisfied in Krishna, what, what was that satisfaction? Satisfaction that he's controlling the senses and following the regulative principles of freedom. And he's given up attachment and aversion. In this way, he's satisfied because he's in Krishna consciousness. Very important, if we're not in Krishna consciousness, we won't be satisfied. We're trying, we, we, you know, we want to be satisfied. If we're satisfied, we will be happy. But if we're not satisfied, oh no, nothing pleases us, we want more, always agitated. So very important. Satis to be satisfied and to be satisfied in Krishna consciousness. That's very important for us. We have to be happy to chant the holy name and to be with the devotees. It, it, it's uh, 
the basic principles of Krishna consciousness. So the threefold miseries of material existence, threefold miseries that can be like uh, adibotic, adiatmic, adidaivic misclishas, the three kind of miseries of the body, and the miseries of the, the mind and words, miseries of, by other living entities, miseries by natural disasters. So these miseries, they don't exist if we're Krishna conscious, because we're Krishna conscious, we're detached from the body. These miseries are all only for the body, but if we know we're not the body, we're not worried about it, we're detached from it. And such satisfied consciousness, one's intelligence is soon well established. So we heard when we, when we become angry, we lose all of our intelligence. But here, when you become Krishna conscious, our intelligence becomes well established. So we get our intelligence. The intelligence is important for us, right? Such satisfied consciousness. One's intelligence is soon well established. We need to use intelligence. Intelligence is for discriminating what is proper and what is not. What is right, what is wrong. What to do, what not to do. Intelligence is how we control the mind. And intelligence sits next to the soul. It's so very important that we cultivate good intelligence. And to do that, we have to be in Krishna consciousness. Okay, there's no purport here. Uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, in, uh, uh, in 5.24, it says, um, happiness is within and rejoice within and the aim is uh, inward. So, uh, what does this actually mean? Is it connection with the Paramatma? Uh, because um, when it comes to the sense object, we can relate to it. But uh, what, what is this actually uh, relating to, Maharaj? Yes, you're right. That the happiness is within it. The point, we're thinking we'll find happiness from the senses. You know, from eating or touching or tasting touch something, you know, we're thinking we'll get enjoyment through the physical use of our senses externally. But Bhagavad Gita is saying the real happiness is within. And that happiness comes from awakening our soul and our and developing the relationship with the, between the soul and the super soul. So, yeah, we get happiness the more we remember the super soul. You take shelter of the super soul. Krishna is in the heart as the super soul. And he's there as our best friend. Right? That's going to be mentioned in 528. The Krishna Suridam Sarva Bhutanam Gyadva Mam Shantim Richati. That he's the best friend of all living entities. So we get happiness from being with our friend, and he is the best friend. But we neglect, we neglect the super soul. We're looking, we're trying to find the new friend who will make us happy. But the real friend is within, and we're neglecting him. Right? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, Vaishnavi. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Fernando Prabhu, do you want to read 2.66? Nasti Bhutti Avyuktasya Natha Yuktasya Bhavana Natha Bhavaya Yataha Santir 
Ashton, yes, yes. Ah, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I've lost my screen. I, I just lost my screen. I'm really sorry. No problem, Prabhu. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, sure, I can read. Uh, actually, I start by the translation, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So, one who is not connected with the Supreme in Krishna consciousness can have uh, can have neither transcendental intelligence nor a steady mind without which there is no possibility of peace. And how can there be any happiness without peace? Purport. Unless one is in Krishna consciousness, there is no possibility of peace. So it is confirmed in the 50th chapter 529 that when one understands that Krishna is the the only enjoyer of all the good results of sacrifice and penance, that he is the proprietor of all universe manifestations, and that he is the real friend of all living entities. Then only can one have real peace. Therefore, if one is not in Krishna consciousness, there cannot be a final goal for the mind. The disturbance is due to want of an an intimate goal. And when is one is certain that Krishna is the enjoyer, proprietor of friend and friend of everyone and everything, then one can, with a steady mind, bring about peace. Therefore, one who is engaged without a relationship with Krishna is certainly always in distress and is without peace. However, much he may make a show of peace and spiritual advancement in life. Krishna consciousness is a self-manifested peaceful condition which can be achieved only in relationship with Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, so what Krishna is describing what happens when we're not connected with Krishna? So the result is neither transcendental intelligence nor a steady mind. The mind is not steady, you will not be peaceful. And so Krishna said, how can there be any happiness if you're not peaceful? And everybody, everyone usually wants happiness. We're all thinking, I want to be happy, I want to enjoy. So Krishna said, first you have to be peaceful. You want to be pe make your mind peaceful, very important. So how to make the mind peaceful? Prabhupada picks up, he goes to the, the last verse of the fifth chapter, 529. I thought it was 28, it's 29, uh, 529. It's the final verse of the fifth chapter. And Prabhupada calls that verse, the peace formula, peace formula, formula for peace, you have, you have to know three things. You have to know that everything belongs to Krishna. That's something difficult because we always think, I'm the proprietor, this is mine, this belongs to me. But the peace formula is to understand everything belongs to Krishna. And then the second thing is that everything is meant for his enjoyment. And the final thing is that he is our best friend. So if we remember these three things, and if we can apply them in our life, then we, we will be peaceful. Shanti, right? When you, sometimes you go to the Indian temple, they will say, Shanti, 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 right? They will speak about peace. They all want peace, people want peace, but they don't know how to get peace. But Krishna is telling us in the Bhagavad Gita, you have to understand everything belongs to him and everything is for his enjoyment. We are trying to enjoy, but we are trying to enjoy separate from him. That creates a problem. When we try to separate ourselves from him, that creates a problem. And we have to remember he is our best friend, very important.
Mm. We've had many friends, right? We have many friends and we see people come and go. Uh, we meet with friends at school and then friends at college. And then you get married and then you get new friends, different friends. And then you get, then you, you live someplace, you, you're working somewhere, you get a job somewhere and then you change your job, work another place, different friends. So many friends coming and going, but one friend who's always with us, the Lord in the heart, the super soul. He is the real friend, the best friend of all living entities. We have to take advantage of him. We have to hear from the super soul, from the Lord in the heart. So Krishna is speaking to us in the form of the Bhagavad Gita. The words of the Bhagavad Gita are not different from the words of the super soul in the heart. We have to hear from him. Yes? Without cultivating our relationship with Krishna, we cannot be peaceful. And we have to recognize Krishna, that he's the proprietor. The house we live in is Krishna's house. And the family we have also are Krishna's. Everything we have is his. And we want to use everything in his service. Okay. Vaishnavi? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Uh, yes. 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 Two point six seven. Uh, uh, who wants to read this two point six seven? Other participants, they can read. Anyone? Kirtida Mataji. Hare Krishna, the Please accept my faces, Guru Hare Krishna. Indriyanyam hi charata yamano nuvid yate tadasya harati pragnam vayarnavam ivam pasi. Translation As a strong wind sweeps away a boat on the water, even one of the roaming senses on which the mind focuses can carry away immense intelligence. Perfect. Unless all of the senses are engaged in the service of the Lord, even one of them engaged in sense gratification can deviate the devotee from the path of transcendental advancement. As mentioned in the life of Maharaja Ambarisha, all of the senses must be engaged in Krishna consciousness. For that is the correct technique for controlling the mind. The end of the prophet. Hare Krishna. So Krishna, Lord Krishna is giving an example here to help us to understand about how we have the danger of the uncontrolled mind. If the mind is not controlled, he gives the example of, about the, the boat on the water swept away by the strong wind. Right. Sometimes you have, you know, have a boat, probably Switzerland, you don't have too many boats there, but uh, if you're on the coast, people like to have boats. But sometimes, you know, you have to, you have to have the boat moored, 
you have to tie the boat to the side, either wind will come, it will blow. And you don't notice a boat being drawn away out into the middle of the ocean. So the same way, any one of the senses on which the mind dwells can take away a man's intelligence. Any one of the roaming senses, right? Our senses are roaming. I mean, they're, they're go looking everywhere, where to enjoy, where am I going to find my pleasure? And sometimes the mind will focus on the tongue, find, sometimes the mind will focus on the eyes, sometimes the mind will focus on the nose, like this. Looking for enjoyment, the mind wants to enjoy. And the mind gets this enjoyment through the senses. So very important to learn to control the senses. Now, so there are two processes. Some people, the mayavadi or the impersonal path, their process is to stop the senses. They say, don't use the senses, stop them. Don't see, don't taste, don't speak. Right? They try to shut themselves off from the world, go away from everything, go to Switzerland, go in the Alps, go up in the mountains, sit there, away from the world. <laughs> Some people do it. They just want to be quiet and go away, but their mind is still with them, and the mind is still disturbed by the senses. So the Krishna conscious process is to use the senses for the service of Krishna. Use all of our senses, just like when we chant japa, we're meant to use all of our senses. We use the tongue to chant, we use the ears to hear. We're, we're not meant to just chant and not hear, we're meant to also hear when we're chanting. And then we're meant to also see Krishna. We should try to chant in the temple or in front of a picture of Krishna. Some devotees, they like to chant in front of the mantra. They will have the mantra printed out on a piece of paper and they will chant in front of the mantra and they can read all the mantra. And so they meditate on the name of Krishna in this way using their eyes to see the mantra and then the nose we can have a flower offered to krishna or you may burn some incense offered to krishna and at the same time our our fingers are counting on the beads so the sense of touch is being also used for the service of krishna so this is meditation using all of our senses carefully to be absorbed in the service of Krishna. Because any one sense can take us away. Can, we can be drawn away. Where do we go? Well, into the world of Maya. <laughs> right? Into the illusion, into the material world. If we're not serving Krishna, then we go to serve Maya. This is the problem. So we have to be very careful. And we have, ex we have experiences like that. When we're chanting, you know, we can be sitting, chanting, holding the beats, but in our mind, we're thinking something else, we're away somewhere. So it's very important to try to fix the mind on Krishna. And fix the mind, we need to also fix the senses. Don't become the servant of the senses. Control the senses. It takes practice, it takes effort, it takes some endeavor. But we can do it. We have Krishna to help us. Krishna is on the side of the devotee. Krishna is helping the devotee. And Krishna is more, so much more attractive than the material world. The material world does not have much to offer us.
Okay, any other questions there? Guru Maharaj, is this possible in one lifetime, Guru Maharaj, to control the senses, to become the master of the senses? Oh, yes, possible, this lifetime. Prabhupada said, this lifetime, we have to become perfect. We have to go back to Godhead, this lifetime. We don't want to come back. Make this the last birth. <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I used to think that it's such an inability that we, we are not able to love Krishna. We are not able to love anyone in this world. Isn't a great inability, Guru Maharaj? We cannot really love anyone or Krishna. Yeah. Well, you do. You, you know, you love your family. You love your, you know, your father and mother. You love your children. You love your husband and so many things you love. You, we give love to other people. Why can't we give love to Krishna? The perfection of love is giving it to Krishna. Because all of these other relationships which we have, they're temporary. Because we, although we've come in a family, this family is not eternal. So we, we've taken birth in a family. Previous life, we were in a different family. We come together in a family just like we come together on the bus or in the train. So it's not an eternal relationship, but the relationship with Krishna is eternal. Real love means to Krishna. So when we give, when we develop that feeling for Lord Krishna and understand everyone, the person who we really love is Krishna. Just like when somebody dies, we don't love the dead body. Why not? Well, the dead, right? We love the person. Where did the person go? He left the body. And we see in Brahma Bimohan Lila in the 10th canto Srimad Bhagavatam, we see the example there how when Brahma stole away the cows and the cowherd boys, Lord Krishna took the place of all the cows and all the cowherd boys. Lord Krishna himself became all of the cows and all of the cowherd boys taken by Brahma. And for one year, Krishna was playing that part. And the cows, they, they had more love than ever for the calves. And the coward boys, their mothers loved them more than they ever loved them. And Balarama was noticing and he saw so much affection. They're giving so much, they, they never usually give so much affection. Why were they giving so much affection? They were giving so much more affection because they loved Krishna more than anybody, more than their own son. The, 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 the mothers loved, the, loved Krishna more than they loved their own son. And the cows loved Krishna more than they loved their own calves. You know, it seems amazing, but it's actually true. This is a fact. The person who we really love is Krishna. We don't love the dead body. We can't, you know, what can you do with the dead body? What we really love is the soul, the spirit. And that spirit is a part of Krishna. So ultimately, the person we really love is Krishna. But out of illusion, out of ignorance, we're giving the love to limited, limited things. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Very clear now. Guru Maharaj? Yes. I'll write uh, one question. Uh, read, please. Okay. okay. What? The story of Vedanta? Is it? Yes. Yes. Oh, there's a story. 
There is a story in Mundaka Upanishad that runs like this. Once in a tree, there were two birds. One at the upper branch, serene, majestic, and divine. And the other at a lower branch, restlessly pecking fruits, sometimes sweet, sometimes bitter. One bird and Paramatma and another bird an individual soul may question, why did Krishna create the senses for individual souls? <laughs> why did Krishna create the senses for individual souls? Well, the senses are the means by which the individual soul has an opportunity to, in, to serve as well as to exploit. We use our senses in the service of Krishna. It is said, Rishikesha Rishikena Sevanam Bhaktir Puchate. One of the names of Lord Krishna is Rishikesh that he is the proprietor of the senses. So the senses all belong to Lord Krishna and we use them in the service of Krishna. We have to learn to use the senses for the pleasure of Krishna. Of course, out of ignorance and because we're in illusion, because we don't have control over our mind and senses. So it happens that people use their senses for sense gratification. Because the senses are the means by which one can enjoy the world. Just like we have a material body, so the material body needs to eat, it needs to be looked after, you need to keep it clean, keep it healthy. So the senses allow us to do these things. Without senses, you could not do that. And you see, you see the animals, they also have their senses. The different dogs and cats and the bears, and they, all have the, they all have their senses. And the same way in the human being, we have the strongest senses. Usually other species of life, they may have only one active, very strong sense, you know, like cats. They can see, their eyes are very powerful. They can see in the dark. And then uh, the fish, he, his active sense is the tongue. He always wants, that's how the people catch fish. They put a worm on the hook and the fish comes by and you try to eat the worm and it gets caught on the hook. And then the deer, a deer in the forest, they're controlled by the sound. So they're hunting the deer, they'll take someone to play the flute and the deer will hear the sound of the flute, he'll become stunned and this way they can come and capture the deer. Elephant is captured by smell. The elephant, the, the female, the male elephant will smell the female elephant and he will come running to find the female elephant. He wants to enjoy the female elephant. And they dig a big hole beside the female elephant. So the male will come running to approach the female elephant. And she's standing right beside a big hole. And this way the big elephant, the male elephant will fall into the ditch. And they capture the male elephant. But he's captured by because of his sense of smell. He was brought by the sense of smell and captured by the sense of smell. So in the human form of life, we have all five senses. The, 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 there's a fly, firefly. Firefly is attracted by the glaring fire, and he'll go, he'll fly right into the fire, he'll be burned. So by their eyesight, by their tongue, by their nose, by their sense of touch, the, all these different animals, they get problems. 
So human form of life, we have five senses and they're all active. We have to learn to use them carefully in the service of Krishna. So Krishna gives us senses so that we can serve him. By doing service, then we get, we get more purification, we get, develop a taste for Krishna consciousness. So it's important for us to have senses and to be able to use them in the service of Krishna. Okay? Okay, thank you very much. I understand. So now? Uh, uh, yes, good. Good. Yeah. Yeah.